Which crown should I wear? Should I wear this one? Or this one? <laughs> Maybe both! I never thought a book could bring me such comfort, such satisfaction, such absolute warmth to read. I think I've gotten so used to being hurt by books I didn't realize when a good-hearted, kind, gentle book was right under my nose, on my bookshelf, waiting for its turn to make me feel good. Where last week's title broke me, this one put me back together. Move over, Meghan Markle, though I love you, because we all know who the real American princess is. Alex Claremont Diaz, first son of the first woman president of the United States, currently running for re-election in 2020. <clears throat> this was written a little while ago. Set in a fantasy world where acceptance and tolerance is upheld by the greatest offices on both sides of the pond, Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston is a true fairy tale story of unexpected enemies to lovers fighting against royal and political odds to be together and find their happily ever after, which, spoiler alert, they do! Hello dear viewers and welcome back to another episode of the Neverland Book Club. If you've not yet subscribed, please think about it, because, you know, thoughts sometimes turn into actions. So I've heard. As introduced today, we will be discussing Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston, one of the most satisfying novels I had the pleasure of reading in the dumpster fire year that was 2020. So nice, I read it twice. I simply found myself crawling back to these characters during stressful times just to remind myself that there is good in the world, there is hope, there is something worth living for within this mundane and cyclical routine of an existence. Alex Claremont Diaz and his sister June are the first children of the first female president. <laughs> <laughs> President Ellen Claremont. Although they are grown adults in their 20s, they still live in the White House with the hopes of breaking into politics and journalism. Accompanied by the granddaughter of the Vice President, Nora Holloran, the trio of young adults find themselves in a slew of messy situations, but none messier than what they find across the pond. When commissioned to attend a royal wedding in London, they are hesitant at first, since Alex had bad blood with the royal prince. Henry. His sworn enemy sees him at the wedding and a tussle arises, resulting in the collapse of a royal wedding cake that's the price of a Texas mansion. Or a tiny home in Los Angeles. And their forced friendship ensues. For publicity's sake and to save face, the two boys must play nice after their big scene. They must assure the two nations that these young men representing the young adult youth of the UK and US respectively are not enemies at all, but allies. After ironing out their despised history towards one another and beginning where all millennial relationships begin, texting non-stop into the morning hours, playing 20 questions to learn more about the other until you both fall asleep with one eye on the screen, Waiting for that fateful buzz, heart fluttering, knowing it may break, but not caring otherwise. <sighs> Feelings grow like a watered and sunny tulip. Their courtship felt organic, gradual, real, really real, actually. McQuiston did an excellent job of capturing what it feels like in the beginning stages of liking someone, of crushing on someone you know or think you shouldn't, but not being able to deny those feelings anyway, of chasing that high that only comes from talking to or being near that person. The chemical releases in the brain that tell you you're in love, but not saying it out loud. Although this isn't a fantasy take on enemies to lovers where one is a princess of a foreign land and the other is a less royal yet important lord of a- wait. No, that's exactly- that's exactly this. But- but no, it's- it's different. Well, it felt different. This did not feel like a fantasy enemies to lovers trope. It wasn't set in a made up world or made up time. There was no mafia's daughter or Capulets and Montagues. It's set in cities I can point to on a map or probably just look up on Google Maps since I don't even know where I am now. It referenced people I've heard of, recent people. It's set in the year 2020 and Although it didn't predict the pandemic, it made me feel like this was perhaps happening in an alternate dimension and that I could live vicariously through these characters, but on the same timeline, if that even makes sense. This novel felt like watching a romantic comedy series that also dealt with heavier situations and social commentary such as racial discrimination, sexism, and sexual double standards, the struggles of the LGBTQ plus community, coming out to your family, loved ones, and your entire country as well as the always needed strong female characters. Although the two protagonists are male characters, they are surrounded by a number of women that help them through their shared predicament, 
without overshadowing their story. Each character has their strengths and weaknesses. June, Alex's sister, is a voice of reason and acceptance for Alex. She helps him put his own thoughts and views into perspective and helps him navigate through coming to terms with his sexuality. She's a talented writer and often writes speeches for her mother, the president. Then there's Nora, the vice president's granddaughter who identifies as bisexual and of Jewish descent. Another talented and witty young lady I felt myself smiling at whenever she entered the scene. Nora actually dated Alex in their younger years, but Alex notes she was just far too smart to ever be with him. Although the relationship ended, they remained friends as Nora is currently working on his mother's re-election campaign. Nora is also a safe place for Alex since he essentially comes out to her first in admitting his secret relationship with the Prince of Wales. Alex's mother, President Ellen Claremont, isn't a huge character in the novel, that is, we don't see too much of her, but her presence is there when Alex talks about himself. I remember tearing up in overall warm-hearted glee while reading the scene of Alex coming out to his mother. She was filled with nothing but acceptance and understanding. Though still being stern in her position as the president and giving publicity a thought, she didn't make Alex feel overshadowed by her job, which I'm sure it could have been written that way if she were a man, but I don't know, it just had a very motherly touch. Although this book was pretty heavy on society's views of important people represented in the LGBTQ community, it also hit on racial discrimination. Alex is half white, half Mexican. His heritage cannot be hidden either by his name nor his skin color. His father, Oscar Diaz, is a senator and gives Alex some insight on what it's like being in the public eye as a person of color. Views and policies that must be looked at from a different angle than other politicians. You're not only the voice of the people you're representing in a certain region, you're also somewhat representing the voice of your heritage in rooms full of people who may not look like you. Rough topics of discussion, but ones that need to be had nonetheless. When Alex and Henry's relationship is inevitably found out, the White House trio scrambles to find a solution, a cover-up. They run into some sexual double standards that are discussed and looked at with such frustration. I felt myself just as enraged as the characters. They decided to make it look like the two boys were simply friends, and that they are both straight in respective relationships with the other two girls in the trio. June with Henry, Alex with Nora. This, of course, it's not the truth and sits well with no one. But when Alex and Henry are outed by an unknown source, they decide not to give a shit what people think of them after all. This ultimately results in uncomfortable conversations with the royal family, <laughs> senators, jabs from journalists, but overwhelmingly, acceptance. This is what was most refreshing. Acceptance is, I think, the absolute overwhelming theme of this book. Acceptance of love, of yourself, of others, even in times during the read where we think the two won't make it, won't work it out, won't be able to be together, they strive for that acceptance within themselves as well as their communities, and it's just so satisfying to read. Now, that's not to say that acceptance to their relationship was a unanimous decision by all of the characters. If so, it just wouldn't be as realistic. McQuiston also does well in this aspect to describe how family members and friends may alienate people of the LGBTQ community simply based on who they've fallen in love with. Another harsh truth that needs to be discussed. The cadence felt unforced and organic. A grass-fed timeline, if you will. It smells like summer, it tastes like bright, fresh flower lavender ice cream. So comforting. Sounds like birds chirping in the morning. Also, the spicy scenes were no disappointment, either. Since there's such built-up tension between Henry and Alex, the scenes when they're just talking, just getting to know each other, it builds to that familiar feeling of texting versus being in front of the person. Getting to know their face, their smell, their touch, and then, finally, their taste. Ooh. The sexual tension to relief ratio was perfectly executed by McQuiston described beautifully without feeling crude. It just delivers on so many different levels. After hearing many recommendations to read this book and how it will make you cry for days, my pessimistic booty thought someone was gonna die for sure. <laughs> An assassination, a suicide, a murder, something. I thought someone was going to die because when do they not? Or that the ending was going to be tragic, but no, not at all. I'm so used to the misery porn of my usual taste I really didn't see this book coming. To my delighted surprise, this is truly a fairy tale, with a once upon a time as well as a happily ever after. And they did live happily ever after, and I did cry, but they were more so tears of utter disappointment in the world we actually live in. I finally felt safe, bright, warm, and 
young in love. The book did what McQuiston sought out or intended for it to do. It succeeded in making me feel something. Which is rare, and I think why it takes me so long to get into fantasy books. I guess I like real-world elements in my stories, something I could relate to on a day-to-day -day level. Even though this had its fantasy elements, its setting and overall plot, the themes, the friendships, the conversations, the strategy was all real. All something I could see myself doing. Either way, I highly recommend this title if you're looking for a triumphant love story between two young, handsome, powerful, and just good-hearted boys. A common question in the book community is, when reading, do you picture yourself as the protagonist, or are you an invisible person in the room, a fly on the wall? This read felt like I could have been more of a visible person in the room. Like I could jump into the conversation at any given moment and give my insight if the urge struck me. I didn't have to see myself as any of the two main characters because there was so much more to relate to than the fact that they were both male and attracted to one another. Well-rounded characters. I'd like to share a quote from McQuiston herself on the book. <coughs> to every person in search of somewhere to belong who happened to pick up this book, I hope you found a place in here, even if just for a few pages. You are loved. I wrote this for you. Keep fighting, keep making history, keep looking after one another. This is why we read, and this is why we write. Connection. Unfiltered, real connection. I felt connected to McQuiston through her words, her phrases, her analogies, and metaphors, and descriptions, but most of all, through her characters. Not one character felt shallow or just a pawn in the overall plot. Each one had a voice, a history, a purpose. It made me think of all the characters in my own life I may have overlooked that had a hand in shaping who I am today. Because these boys owe that to their fellow characters. Their identities only surfaced due to their surroundings. Yes, forced at times, but their flexible nature and adaptable demeanor was a situational learned trait brought on by experience and environment. This book is for everyone. There isn't a person I think who wouldn't enjoy it based on what it provides for the reader, an overall feeling of love and acceptance. And I think everyone could use a little bit of that in their lives. I'd say in a technical sense, this book is for people adjusting to their 20s, learning who they are and discovering themselves, and as they do so, need a bit of inspiration or a safe space to know that they are understood. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video if you liked it and comment down below if you prefer the world building fantasy or a more contemporary fantasy such as, such as, such as, such as this. You already know my answer. If you'd like to read the hard copy or ebook version of Red, White, and Royal Blue, affiliate links as always are in the description below. However, if you'd like to listen to it, check it out on Audible. I personally listened to a bit of it and was just about hypnotized by the narrator. I absolutely love his voice and I think it captures the essence of Alex and Henry perfectly well. Audible, as you know, has the largest library of audio content for your enjoyment. Click below for a free trial if you'd like to hear what I'm talking about. All right. Today's shout out goes to Christy Bryson. Thank you so much for your support and for watching. Our little conversation in the comments truly made me smile last week. Stay lost, keep reading, be kind to one another, goodbye!